building in the Northern Pacific across North Dakota, of course, started at Fargo and uh, proceeded uh, westward uh, in the 1871-72 uh, uh, era. Thomas Rosser was the uh, chief surveyor at the time, and he basically was responsible for locating the line, and their attempt was to find as direct a route as they could across North Dakota, knowing that they had to cross the Missouri River at some point. Uh, and there were a number of surveys of different uh, alignments made. Uh, but it came down to uh, Bismarck became the point where they decided to cross. The building of the railroad commenced, uh, and uh, they got to Bismarck in uh, about July of 1873, and that was the end of construction because at that time the panic of 1873 ensued and all construction work on the NP came to a halt. What would you say was the single biggest problem or obstacle in building the original uh, trackage from Minnesota out to Seattle? Well, uh, I guess there were a number of problems, but they're interrelated. Uh, one is manpower. Nobody out there. Uh, that's one thing. Number two is equipment that they had was very, very, there was no equipment to speak of. And uh, so everything was labor, hand labor. And uh, you can imagine uh, every bridge uh, had to be done by hand. You couldn't uh, get a truss from somebody. Steel that you used was uh, not there. So the whole thing was uh, really um, a massive undertaking. After several years of building inactivity, the Northern Pacific finally got its finances figured out and restarted construction in 1881, right where it had stopped construction a few years earlier at the Missouri River. The first job the NP needed to do was build a bridge across the Missouri River, uh, the Bismarck Bridge. Of course, building a railroad is extremely expensive, and it was very, very difficult to try and sell Northern Pacific stock, as uh, after several years of inactivity, most investors thought the Northern Pacific would fail. Uh, the United States government wanted the Northern Pacific to succeed because they wanted a railroad across the northern tier of states so they could open up that area. But the government wouldn't give the NP any money either. But the uh, United States government did promise the Northern Pacific vast amounts of land on both sides of the tracks as the Northern Pacific built westward uh, toward the Pacific Ocean. Uh, of course, the United States government imposed a schedule on the Northern Pacific. They weren't going to give them all the time in the world to complete this, and the NP was already behind after a few years of inactivity, and it needed to get trains with supplies and people over to the other side of the river before the Missouri River Bridge was completed. This brings us to our first mystery of the Bismarck Bridge, which is what sort of plan could the Northern Pacific come up with to get trains across the Missouri River with no bridge. The Northern Pacific actually had two plans for running trains across the Missouri River before the Bismarck Bridge was built. One plan for winter and one plan for summer. The winter plan uh, started with construction of pilings in the river before the river froze over and then running wood stringers horizontally on top of the pilings at about the level where the ice would be on the top of Missouri. And once the Missouri iced over, they would place very wide, 12-foot uh, wide ties over the stringers and then rails on top of those. And that's how they would run trains across the Missouri River in the winter. And when spring came, they would uh, lift the uh, timber stringers out and uh, just let the uh, flow, the heavy flow of the Missouri break off the piling and uh, that was the end of the bridge so it was truly a temporary bridge but it did allow them to proceed westerly. The ferry boat was uh, used during the summertime uh, to transfer material from one side to the other from east to west. The most dangerous and demanding job in building the Bismarck Bridge was the construction of the concrete foundations that are under the two piers that are out in the middle of the river. And making this job all the more difficult is the fact that you just can't pour concrete on the river bottom. In this case, you had to dig down about 50 or 60 feet 
so that the concrete was resting on either hard clay or bedrock under the river. And remember, this was 1881 when railroad bridge building was in its infancy, and basically they're out in the middle of nowhere. And the answer to this dilemma is something called caissons. At least in this instance, a caisson is a very, very large wood structure. Looks like a shipping crate. It's about the size of a house, and it's built on the shoreline. And we have a photo of one, and first we're going to take a look at the men on shore who've just slid the caisson into the water. And we see the caisson. You can see how big it is compared to the men. From here, the caisson is taken over and put into location on the uh, river where the pier would be and then sunk down to the riverbed. The Bismarck Bridge was completed in the same year that the Brooklyn Bridge in New York was completed. Both bridges used caissons in building the foundations for their piers. Uh, let's take a look at a diagram of a caisson as used in the Brooklyn Bridge. The caissons had bottom chambers with no floors in them. Here we see men in the bottom chambers digging away at the uh, river bottom with picks and shovels. They'll dig downward however far it takes in order to hit hard bedrock or clay where the uh, concrete foundation can rest. Here the mystery is how do they prevent river water from flowing in under the lower edges of the caisson, filling the work chamber with water, thus by drowning the men. Well, the answer is air pressure. When the men arrived for work in the morning, they would climb down a tube and into the chamber, and after they got in the chamber, the tube would be sealed off, and they would pump in air at very high pressure, 40 to 50 pounds. Uh, that's extremely high. An ordinary car tire uh, has an air pressure of around 32 pounds per square inch, so that was a greater pressure than you have in a car tire. They weren't aware of the very big, very serious problem of having men work in pressurized environments. Today, when a deep sea diver comes up from the ocean floor, they come up very slowly and in stages in order to prevent a disease called the Benz or decompression sickness, which can cause uh, paralysis and even death. The same thing was happening with the caisson workers, but they didn't know exactly what was going on. They didn't know how to prevent it and uh, with the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, there were 110 documented cases of what they call caisson disease. Today we know uh, that was the Benz or decompression sickness. Perhaps conveniently, in the building of the Bismarck Bridge, there is no record of the number of deaths or illnesses connected with the building of the bridge, although we do know uh, from newspaper accounts that deaths were taking place. And this brings us to our next mysteries of the Bismarck Bridge, which is what were the working conditions in the caissons? And why would men take on jobs working in these kinds of conditions? And what did they earn? The standard wage for a bridge operator at that time was $2 per day. And that's per day, not per hour. This was right at the end of the financial panic of 1873. That was a major financial depression going throughout the country and uh, many people were jobless, and there were very few social programs, hardly any at all. There was no such thing as unemployment insurance or uh, stimulus checks. If a person wanted a dollar in their pocket, they would have to go out and earn it. And you can be quite sure that there were, was a lot of news around St. Paul and Chicago about these jobs that were to be had, the construction jobs, out on the very edge of civilization, literally on the edge of civilization uh, at the Missouri River. So uh, they were able to draw out a certain amount of uh, laborers, and I'm sure the Northern Pacific uh, paid their way out, but if they wanted to quit, uh, you'd have to think that the Northern Pacific was not going to pay their way back to St. Paul. Uh, when they enlisted in St. Paul to go out to the job site, they probably had no idea that they would, might be working in a caisson or what the conditions would be uh, there. Uh, the caissons were typically wet on the floor, and we know there were no electric lights in the caissons, so they were lit by uh, flame, probably kerosene lanterns. The only written description we have of uh, caisson work back in those days was written by Frank Farrington, who is the 
uh, chief mechanic for the Brooklyn Bridge construction, and here's what Frank had to say. Inside the case, on everything was an unreal, weird appearance. There was a confused sensation in the head, like the rush of many waters. The pulse was at first accelerated, then sometimes fell below the normal rate. The voice sounded faint, unnatural, and it became a great effort to speak. What with the flaming lights, the deep shadows, the confusing noise of hammers, drills, and chains, the half-naked forms flitting about, if of a poetic temperament, get a realizing sense of Dante's Inferno. One thing to me was noticeable, time passed quickly in the caisson. Construction of the piers was completed in June 1882, and after that it took just three and a half months to erect the steel and iron superstructure. But before the Northern Pacific could put the bridge into use, it had to make sure that that bridge would hold the very heavy weight of the trains that would be crossing it every day. The bridge uh, was tested by using a string of uh, eight uh, mogul NP locomotives that they would uh, move out on each of the 400 foot spans and they would measure uh, the deflections and, uh, calcu or the word, and compare those to that that had been calculated for the design and that was the accept the test acceptance uh, criteria for uh, beginning operations on the bridge. Each one of those locomotives had a fire in its box as well as a fireman and an engineer in its cab. And ever since seeing the bridge testing photos, I've wondered what was going through the minds of those men. They were out there on a as yet untested bridge carrying more weight than it had ever uh, been expected to carry. And had the bridge collapsed, uh, the men would have gone down with the locomotives and almost certainly lost their lives in the Missouri River. Were they nervous about that? Were they afraid? Or did they just think that was the best thing ever that they could be doing that day? Well, I've never seen a written account of that, and that's probably something that's just lost to history forever. The Northern Pacific completed this line in 1883 when a construction crew coming in from the west met the eastbound construction crew at a little place in Montana near present-day Missoula. In the process, the, the little railroad that people thought wouldn't make it collected some 40 million acres of land in land grants from the United States government for having completed the railroad and became one of the largest, if not the largest, landholders in the United States. Uh, the Northern Pacific laid its first rail near Duluth, Minnesota in 1870, and in 1970, the Northern Pacific merged with a couple of other railroads to form the Burlington Northern, which has become the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. So it's really been one of the lar largest, biggest uh, success stories in corporate America. Uh, going back in time, back into the late 1800s and early 1900s, the Northern Pacific uh, carried more and more freight. The trains got bigger, the locomotives got bigger. As a matter of fact, at times, the Northern Pacific would have the largest locomotives in the world. Because of that, uh, in 1905, they had uh, to replace the steel superstructure of the Bismarck Bridge. The uh, president of the Northern Pacific declared that the bridge would have to remain in use during the replacement of the superstructure. So that brings us to still another mystery of the Northern Pacific, and that's how in the world did the Northern Pacific replace that steel superstructure without interrupting daily traffic? We have a few early photos of the Bismarck Bridge, but fortunately we have this one taken in 1905 that shows how uh, they were able to keep trains running across the river while the superstructure was replaced. Uh, they built a temporary bridge abutting the original bridge, the temporary bridge actually using the uh, existing piers for support, and uh, they ran the trains across the temporary bridge while they uh, replaced the existing superstructure with the current humpback design. On the right in this photograph, you see some of the men in a crane utilized in the uh, 1905 replacement. On the left is a flat car carrying beams and you'll see the holes in the uh, beams. These beams were riveted together. They weren't welded together and I've often wondered with all the thousands and thousands of rivet holes in a bridge like this, how in 1905 did they make those holes? They didn't have carbide bits at that time, uh, no fancy plasma cutters. Whether they drilled the holes or punched them, I don't know. Thank you.
the country would have developed without the Northern Pacific, but the time frame would be completely different. So uh, uh, even General Sherman, who at one time said that uh, there was nothing but a frozen wasteland fit for neither man nor beast, changed his mind and said without the railroad, uh, the country would never be developed. Had the Northern Pacific failed in its attempt to build a Bismarck Bridge and gone into bankruptcy, another railroad would have come along later and bridged the Missouri and built that line out to Puget Sound. But it's very unlikely that they would have attempted to build a bridge in the same place where the previous efforts had failed. Uh, they probably would have built it either upstream or downstream someplace, in which case uh, there probably wouldn't be a current Bismarck. That would probably all be very nice wheat fields in that area. And this brings us up to the last mystery we'll cover, and that is, is the Bismarck Bridge in service today? The piers, now nearly 140 years old, and the superstructure, placed 115 years ago, are still used daily by Burlington Northern Santa Fe freight trains. Completion of the Bismarck Bridge was the first step in the path that facilitated the development of America's last frontier, including the states of North Dakota, Montana, Idaho, and Washington. It unlocked the door to the region's growth, natural resources, jobs, and vibrant economy. Across it came the transportation and material needs for the northwestern states. Today, the bridge stands as the most iconic and recognizable landmark remaining from that era. The Bismarck Bridge has been placed on the National Trust for Historic Preservation's list of America's 11 most endangered historic places, where it joins an elite group of the country's most valued treasures. Culturally and historically, it is a railroad bridge without equal. It stands as a memorial to Americans who thought big, gathered at a small spot in the wilderness, worked hard to overcome countless obstacles while enduring miserable conditions, and performed a great feat of engineering, all despite the challenges of a remote, primitive, and dangerous environment. The Bismarck Bridge stands as a testimony to American ingenuity and sets an example of determination, hardship, and courage that we may never see again. But its life as a railroad bridge will soon be over. Its owner, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe, is making plans to replace the Bismarck Bridge and prefers to tear it down, which runs in strong opposition to the wishes of many North Dakotans who want to convert it to a hiking and bike path, thereby saving the landmark and providing a recreational connection between the towns of Bismarck and Mandan. If you want to know the ongoing status of the Bismarck Bridge, visit friendsoftherailbridge.org. Anyone wanting to research the mysteries of the Bismarck Bridge can start their search in these two places, in Bismarck at the North Dakota Heritage Center and in St. Paul at the Minnesota Historical Society where you'll find the Northern Pacific Railway's corporate records.